It's my pleasure to introduce John Hagen. He's the president of our Climate Common. Uh, he has a PhD from North Carolina State University in wildlife ecology. He studied various environmental topics in partnership with the forest industry and the CFRU for the past 30 years. He's certainly been uh, actively involved with all of us. He's currently president of Our Climate Common, a nonprofit that engages sectors of our economy that have been left out or left behind in the climate conversation. In 2007, he was awarded the Austin H. Wilkins Forest Stewardship Award, and in 2009, the Integrity and Conservation Award from New England, the New England Society of American Foresters. So it's my pleasure to introduce John Hagen. Thank you, John. Thank you, Pat. Um, can everybody hear in the back okay? I was back there earlier and okay, good. I'm gonna try to speak up. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, it must have been about six months ago that Jimmy Robbins called me and asked me uh, or talked about speaking at the Maine Forest Products Council meeting today. And I said, Jimmy, I can think of about 10 people that would be better than me to speak to this group. To which Jimmy said, John, I'm not really asking. <laughs> so, uh, well, I've never been so flattered in my life uh, to be given a directive, but I'm, I'm glad to be here this morning to try to make some sense of sort of the forest carbon offset uh, and climate change situation. Some of you are as old as me. I may remember that my claim to infamy was saying that clear cuts were really good for birds of conservation concern in about 1992. Uh, and we just replicated, I can't talk about it today because I have to talk about carbon, but we just replicated that study in the last two years from 30 years ago. And it's still a really good news story. And Pat Soroy promises that I'm going to be able to talk to the SFI Wildlife Committee sometime this winter. Uh, but today I've got to talk about forest carbon. It's probably the most complex subject that I've ever tried to wrap my head around. Uh, but I'm going to try to try to give some, some of it will be science, some of it will be opinion. Not everybody agrees with me. I'm fine with that. So I, I just want to take two minutes, I promise only two, to talk a little bit about climate science because it really underpins the reason we're having any conversation about forest carbon offsets. One of the comments I get most often from people I work with is that the climate has always changed. There's nothing special going on here. Well, the difference is now we know the climate has always changed, and we know that. But now we've got some sense of why it's changing. So this is a trace of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere for the last 11,000 years or so since the glaciers left. For most of that time, the concentration was between about 180 and 280 parts per million. Now we're at about 413 uh, parts per million. So what the heck has caused that to happen? Uh, well, in the last 150 years or so, we put about 2.4 trillion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. <clears throat> when we figured out all the good things we could do with coal and oil. We started using it in the late 1800s. And when you put that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you're going to see increases in, uh, in the concentration in the atmosphere. Now, why, why do we care um, about carbon dioxide when solar radiation hits the Earth's surface and bounces off, it causes uh, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide to, uh, that's making noise, so there, that's got it. It causes these molecules to vibrate, things that vibrate heat up. So it's no wonder that the earth is heating up because of the carbon concentration of carbon dioxide. It's just physics, it's not our fault, it what it's what goes on. So, uh, Maine, as most of you know, I think, has got a new uh, climate action plan that was put out, I think, in December 
of 2020. Pat Strout was a key part of putting together that plan. And Maine, like uh, most nations uh, and many states, I think about half the states have set very ambitious carbon emissions reduction goals. Maine has, uh, we actually beat our 2020 goal uh, and we're well below, 10% uh, below the 1990 emissions, which was, which was the goal. We've got a 2030 goal of 45% um, in 45% below 1990 by 2030. And then a fairly ambitious goal of reducing emissions by 80% by 2050. So, and I, this is just reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, fossil fuel use. Uh, and it's pretty typical of, of most nations on, on earth, as I said. Now, the only, the thing that, where it starts to intersect with you guys is a goal of carbon neutrality by 2045. And what that means is any, any emissions that we're still emitting in 2045, uh, the goal is to offset them with sequestration of carbon by some other way. So the net change is basically zero by 2045. Well, everybody knows trees uh, take up carbon. So that's where people that are thinking about climate change start to focus on forest and intersect with, with your industry. So UMaine, folks at UMaine, Aaron and his team at UMaine calculated, I think it was a couple of years ago, that the forests of Maine and forest products, because carbon is stored in forest products as well, sequesters about 75% of the annual fossil fuel emissions for Maine. No other, that doesn't happen in any other state because we're 89% forested. So a lot of focus on trees and no engineer could have invented a device to more efficiently remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than trees. And, and oh, by the way, we like trees as well. Well, not just governments are focused on uh, uh, carbon neutrality, but companies as well. Microsoft, Google, Delta, Delta Airlines, the, the list goes on and on. These companies have also set a goal of reducing their emissions over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And it's really hard, as Maine understands, it's really hard to get those emissions to zero. So a lot of companies are also looking at forest carbon offsets as a way to get them to carbon neutrality, to net zero emissions. I think they, I think they set their goal before they thought about it. <laughs> because they've got to figure out that now that you, when you say publicly, we're going to get to net zero, then you got to go figure, figure out how you're going to do it. And they know they can't get there by going to, to actually zero fossil fuel emissions. So forest, trees grow, let's grow some trees and bring us down to net zero. And that's why there's so much focus now on forest carbon offsets. The, the global carbon market was in, uh, 2021 was $851 billion, just the carbon market. In the U.S., the voluntary carbon market has quadrupled since 2020, just two years ago. So there's enormous demand for carbon offsets. So people are coming to you <laughs> to help out with that. Now, there are two problems with forest carbon offsets. And I'm not, I, I got to say, for the sake of transparency, I'm not a big fan of forest carbon offsets the way they work right now. And I got good friends and colleagues that are in favor of it. So it's OK. Uh, but, but my uh, view is that they're not, that they lack a certain amount of integrity. The, the carbon project developers and the standards are working hard to try to fix some of these problems. But one, there are two that I'm going to mention. One is additionality. When you, when you buy a carbon offset, like Microsoft buys a carbon offset, it, it needs to be 
additional carbon above and beyond what was going to happen anyway. So if you were going to go tr grow trees anyway, that's, that's good, but they're not going to pay you for what you were going to do anyway. They're only going to pay you for, for some change in behavior that acquires additional carbon above what, would have happened, what you would have done anyway. So if you're a landowner, you've got to change your forestry behavior in some way and prove that you're going to, you're going to sequester more carbon than you would have otherwise. This is called the uh, issue of additionality. And companies, the big companies, are keenly aware of this additionality issue because they're vulnerable to criticism if they don't get additional carbon. And from my perspective, I mean, I'm a, uh, an ecologist, but my primary concern is getting that carbon out of the atmosphere. If Microsoft emits a thousand tons in a given year, they need that back. You, you, you have to get that carbon back somehow. Otherwise, it's not real um, and it makes no difference to the atmosphere. So this additionality issue is something, if you're a landowner thinking about the carbon markets, you've got to be thinking about what are we going to do differently? that would get more carbon than we would have otherwise. And it can include storage in products, by the way. <clears throat> the second issue challenge to carbon offsets is leakage. And so one of the, one of the main ways you see these carbon offset projects take shape in the field is extending rotation length. So let's say you were gonna cut the trees but instead of cutting them, you just let them grow some more. It's deferring, essentially deferring harvest. And okay, so you store more carbon in that place, in, in your forest, but humans still need wood and paper. So it's going to come from somewhere else. Maybe it comes from somewhere else in Maine. Maybe it comes from somewhere else in the region. Maybe it comes from some other continent. But, but it's an illusion if you're just deferring harvest and we still need and use forest products. It's just an illusion that you're, save, you're storing more carbon in any particular place. So these two issues, additionality and leakage, are really hard uh, to crack. People are working on it and we'll see what the solutions are. Uh, we think we've got some of the folks I work with, including you, mean feel like we've got an idea on where we can go from here that uh, avoids the additionality and leakage issue. I'll talk about that in a minute. But if, you, if you're not familiar with these issues, these two issues, you should Google John Oliver, carbon offsets, and it's like a 23 minute hilarious takedown. It's kind of, it either makes you, makes you laugh or makes you cry, but it's a takedown of forest carbon offsets. So he can teach this way better than I can uh, so for the, I mentioned for the past two years or so, I've been uh, working with a group. Jim Robbins has been a part of it. M many of you in this room have been a part of this project called Forest Carbon for Commercial Landowners. And we set out to, uh, like I said, to crack this additionality in leakage issue. And we asked the question, can we store more carbon in Maine's forest and in products and maintain harvest levels? all at the same time. We want our cake and eat it too. So how would we do that? Is it even possible? Well, Aaron and Adam Dagno and folks at UMaine and this whole team have just, just about to finish that analysis that should be published in the next month or so. And the conclusion is, yes, we can do that. We can store more carbon in the forest. We can store more carbon in products and we can maintain harvest at the same time. If we don't, we just leak. It's not really legitimate. So where we are now, um, the good news, I think, is that a couple of, uh, well, a week ago, there was a big announcement by the Secretary Vilsack of, I think, a billion dollars of grants to help crack this nut of how to store more carbon in the forest and maintain harvest and keep wood commodities flowing. It's agriculture and forestry. And he made an announcement, I guess, uh, almost, almost a week ago that, there, that the New England Forestry Foundation 
would be receiving a $30 million grant. That's a lot of money to those of us in the nonprofit sector to help figure out what kinds of uh, mechanisms might be put into place to store more carbon in the forest and in products uh, through silvicultural investments. And I've never met a forest, I know a lot of foresters and I don't think I've ever met one that didn't want to spend more money on silviculture. They always do. So this could be an opportunity to, for you all to help uh, shape a program that would invest in silviculture in Maine. So I think that's, that's good news. Uh, it's a project that will be playing out over the next five years. Many of you are a part of that. Many of you wrote letters in support of the New England Forestry Foundation to get this grant. So, so I think you don't need to answer this question today, but I think this is the question that the industry should be thinking about. What would a program look like that supports increased investment in silviculture that in turn increases carbon in the forest and in forest products? Now's the opportunity. There's a lot of money for investment in silviculture and maybe more coming. So um, I'm gonna stop there and, and take questions, any questions you have um, or any ideas you have about where we should go forward. I'm not really a, a part of the, of the project that I just talked about, but, uh, but I, have, I have connections. So Peter. Well, right. Uh, um, a couple of ways I could go with that. I'm, I'm not, I, I struggle, I still struggle with the forest carbon offset deal. I'm more of a proponent of incentive systems of various sorts um, where we invest in silviculture, which will in turn, I think, help all of you who would like to do more silviculture but maybe can't afford it. And the carbon, uh, the carbon benefits aren't going to be realized right away this year. It might be a decade before the silvicultural investments actually turn around the, the carbon to it. A net pot impact, pre-commercial thinning, we might actually cut some trees before we see the return in carbon. So that's, but these companies need the return now. They need that offset, right? Because right, they put the carbon into the atmosphere. That's why I think that this new grant seems to be more focused on an incentive system where just do good silviculture and we're not, We'd like to we'd like to know through air and science that the carbon benefits are going to come, but they don't need to come right now this year. They might come down the line. I'm I'm not sure I answered your question, but it it explains why I think some kind of incentive system is a better approach. And there are other models in forestry for incentive systems. So um, so I'm I'm at least right now a proponent of an approach like that where. We know the carbon's going to come, and we don't have to worry too much about counting it right now because the science tells us it's going to come. Uh, and you're not obligated as a landowner to, to, to count every single ton that you produce, which is what the voluntary market requires. It's an expensive and onerous process. Long answer, so I'm not sure I got it. Yes, back. So for additionality, if you don't want to compensate, if you only want to compensate people for things that they wouldn't have otherwise done, that's the way you said that, a land trust that would have conserved land and was not intending to do much harvesting should get nothing, correct? Um, a landowner that did a lot of harvesting before but is ref refraining from some of that harvesting should get paid more. Is that correct? Uh, 
it is correct. The, the way the, it depends on the market, but the way the California uh, offset market, which is a regulatory environment in California, uh, will pay you for any carbon you got above the average of the mean for your, your region. And you don't actually have to change behavior. You did the change of behavior in the past. So that's, that model is coming under a lot of scrutiny. The same for what you said about conservation groups, that really their intention was not to cut much wood. Anyway, that's also coming under scrutiny. And I, the, way, uh, the way I see the voluntary carbon market developing is that's probably not going to be OK going forward. And it has made it OK in the past, but I don't think it's going to make it in the future. Like I said, they're, they're learning the carbon market people who create the standards are learning as they go. And they're realizing that they're vulnerable to that, the criticism of the additionality. And it's changing. So um, did I answer your, your question? There might have been a second part. Yeah. So my question should be a little bit quicker, and I think we're pressed on timing, so I'm guessing I'm the last question. Um, on the incentive-based programs, if a program was to exist on that, how would you suggest it would be created? Is it going to be a free market system, or is it going to be through a government agency like USDA and RCS? Because historically, those have been troublesome and i don't know the answer to that but they have i do have heard that they've been troublesome they're too onerous nobody nobody wants to bother with nrcs it's too much paperwork i think what something new needs to be invented i don't know who would administer it whether it be the state or the the feds or somewhere in between but i i see something much simpler where um Landowners are paid to change civil cultural practices that are good for them, good for the forest, good for forest products. And so long as you document how many acres you've treated with civil cultural system A, B, or C, you get paid for that. It's, it's a much simpler approach. And like I said, there are other models for this kind of investment. Some involve too much paperwork. But that's where I think the opportunity is we we, including all of you, can create something that works for you. So I think it's a new day, um, and it, it needs some new thinking. The whole issue needs new thinking. Pat, have we got more time? or? Um. What do you say to people who say this climate crisis is too urgent to wait to do civil culture and see that pay off in the future, that what has to happen is stop cutting trees now in order to make a difference with our forest? Uh, it is urgent, and I'm at the front of the line for acknowledging how urgent this is. But we're not going to, and there are people that want to just stop cutting trees everywhere. It's called pro-forestation, and you probably run into to those folks. The problem is we still need wood for all kinds of things. The global population is still growing. We're not going to stop needing wood anytime soon. So, so you all are very important to meeting that need. I think what you can also do, though, is store more carbon in the forest and in products. So the opportunity is there. I, I, to I don't understand the pro-forestation folks because I don't understand where the wood is supposed to come from. It's really not in my backyard, the classic example of not in my backyard. It just makes no sense to me. And I'm an ecologist. I get it. <laughs> so so I, I think we got to hold firm, and I mean you and me, that these products are going to be needed. And we can invent new products, by the way, that store more carbon. That's the opportunity. So you know, I'm not, I don't have much patience with that argument. OK. Jimmy, since you invited me, you get <laughs> Or was it a directive? It was more like a directive. Uh, dipping into your no. All right, well, 
Thank you all. Oh, well, thank uh, you, Pat. Thank you. And we got a little uh, gift for you. It's heavy, so it must be oh, good. It must I think it's important. I think it's made in Maine. Okay. But thank you very thank much you for all. your.